is like you thought about things such as prosthetics and the kind of humanoid robots that were starting to be developed at the time. And he wrote an essay that appeared in the journal Energy in 1970, Buk Bukimi Notani. And we'll be hearing from, we are fortunate to have him speak today on his reflections on this foundational essay that, that is also been reprinted in IEEE Robotics and, Automa Robotics and Automation magazine. And I want to say a special thanks, by the way, to Erico Guizzo and, uh, and, um, and uh, Peter Cork for their help in organizing that special issue. The, um, the idea will be expounded at length today, but it, for anybody, I think everybody in this room understands it very deeply, but the idea is that there's a measure of human affinity on the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis is the measure of human likeness. And so as there's a steep nonlinearity that occurs, when, some, when a robot or, or object becomes more and more human, and suddenly reaches the, in this inflection point where it suddenly becomes um, the, the affinity drops dramatically. And this is exaggerated in the presence of motion. The term uncanny valley, as far as we know, appeared in 1978 to describe this phenomenon that Professor Mori identified in 1970. Uh, this was done by a, a, an art historian and curator, um, Yazia Reichart, in this book, um, Robots, Fact, Fiction, and Prediction. Today, it has had enormous influence in many different aspects, from the design of prosthetics, so the design on the right is, for example, less uncanny than the design on the left. It has had influence on fields like computer graphics, where something like this design, if you look closely at the eyes, there's a kind of visceral negative response in Polar Express, in contrast to uh, Toy Story, where the eyes are very simplified and often, as a result, feel much more comfortable to an audience's. This question of what is alive and what is not is at the fundamental root of what we do as roboticists. And, it's, and it recurs over and over again today. This uh, is a uh, recent phenomenon known as Reborners. This is not a human doll, uh, not a human child, it is a doll. And is a, there is a, a, a very large subgroup of, uh, of, of um, followers who buy these dolls, trade these dolls, and focus on these dolls that are incredibly lifelike um, babies. It has also influenced the, the realm of art, with artists like Orlan pushing the boundaries of the uncanny in her own face, um, artists like Stellark. And it also exceeds into, it extends into the realm not only of the visual, but also the auditory. When something that sounds um, a little too lifelike for comfort and influences the design of interfaces. I also think this, has to, this is relevant to issues like cosmetics um, and fashion. And um, <clears throat> so you can see, for example, elements, examples of something that appears uh, a bit on the margins of the comfort zone. Um, and these examples, and I, I, I'd like to point out that in, in the original, um, there are two inflection points, and I want to postulate a third inflection point here on the, uh, on the far right axis when the, a little bit of, of artifice is oftentimes increases our affinity. And then as we, if we're coming in from the, from the right hand side, and this is, um, this is something that will also come up again in the discussions from our respondents. So <clears throat> this topic is of immense importance culturally and has resulted in many, many writings and books. The, um, and, what we're, what, and, and I want to say that, the, as I mentioned earlier, the translation of this essay, the English translation, was first appeared in, in 2012. And um, we, are, uh, we, we did a follow-up workshop uh, six months ago with a number of um, individuals who are here again today. And during the course of that workshop, we, we came to an, an instant, and there was a moment, um, which I'll tell you about at the conclusion of today's session, where we made a link with Professor Mori, um, and, uh, and that's at the stage for today's, um, today's special panel. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our honored speaker today. And I'll switch over, we can switch over the uh, computer while I do this. <coughs> Dr. Mori, Dr. Masahiro Mori is Professor Emeritus at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And he is known in Japan as the Japanese father of robotics. 
His early work in academia includes automation technology, artificial, the design of an artificial multi-fingered hand, swarm robots, and many other advances. In addition to his academic work, he's an excellent spokesman to the media, and he is well known as the founder of the Robot Contest here in Japan. He is often referred to as Dr. Robot in the media. After his retirement from the, from the Tokyo Institute of Technology, he became Professor Emeritus in 1987, and he established the Jizai Laboratory. Jizai means flexible thinking. And as the president of this laboratory, he did many things. He wrote books, he directed Robocom, he in fact was the president of the Japanese Society of Robotics at the time that this conference was founded and gave a keynote lecture, I just learned, at the first IROS conference in 1985. He has been awarded many awards and we would spend the entire hour and a half listing his many honors. But let me say that one of them that was most, perhaps most important is the Emperor's Medal with Purple Ribbon, which he was awarded in 1994. So please join me in, in, in welcoming Professor Masahiro Mori. <laughs> 